This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Carlson podcast, and uh, I think we have the whole group back today. Brad, how Greetings. you been doing, man? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Doing yep. good. Mike, everything's hot here in Atlanta. Yeah, it is hot. Hot Atlanta. Hot Atlanta. Yep. And Randall, of course, star of the show. <laughs> oh shucks! <laughs> Beaming light in all directions. <laughs> Studio's looking good. It is. I yeah. know. Looked like. Uh, there's been some work going on. In yeah, this. Oh, that, yeah. Uh, is there Check a- this out. See, right back here, I've got another camera mounted on the boom, which is on a movable gantry on the ceiling. And right there, I've got my drawing pad. So I've been doing some uh, online coachings with some get, of the boys get- that are going to be helping at the Sacred Geometry Workshop on the 13th and 14th of August, which by the time you're hearing this will have been in the past. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but travel. is at present in our future right time travel is fun yeah so this is it's, i know it's very very confusing but they can still uh purchase the uh, the live stream and and watch it as video on demand later ongoing and and get the basics because it is kind of a, a primer for yes. the course that you're going to record right there in that studio so, that's yeah, right that's primarily what he's getting set up for so yeah we're excited to get that in production there's going to be about 10 hours of instruction, and it's going to be the basics. It's going to be hands-on. It's, you know, I know you can't see here, but there's, a, we got my compass, my straight edge, all the tools and implements. And uh, we put together uh, a bundle for the supplies of everything you would need to, ha- to effectively participate in creating these drawings, you know, um, the handmade cherry wood compasses that my brother makes, uh, the... Uh, a scriber that you can use with uh, drawing implements for making nice tight little um, circles and arcs with the cherry wood compass we can make nice big arcs drop to like circles almost like up to 16 inches in diameter you know the bundle includes colored pentel colored pens uh, art artists colored pencils so we can incorporate the the um, um, color because that's very helpful when you're trying to envision these patterns and diagrams of sacred geometry, particularly as they become more complex and more detailed. So it's a whole bundle. You go on to uh, HowTube or RandallCarlson.com, and there will be an announcement about the live stream. And then the live stream is going to, as Brad said, is going to be recorded, and that will be available in perpetuity to anybody who buys a ticket or who wants to participate in the live stream. But... If you do, you get access to the download, like I think typically within 48 hours, and you can use have it, use it, watch it, rewatch it, watch it with your family, your friends, or whatever. Um, and we try to keep the price down to just 72 bucks, and I think that's a hell of a deal, especially if three or four people go in together. And uh, and and the and this is the basics. The idea is, like I said in one of the promo videos we did, if you want to. Climb as if you want to ascend the heights. The higher you want to go, the deeper and stronger and more solid your foundation needs to be. So this is about foundation, getting down to basics. And as a designer and builder, I've been, I'm very much intrigued. Not, I, of course, the metaphysics, the symbology, the philosophy, all of that, those components of sacred geometry. But I'm very interested in the practical applications. How do you use it to, to build something, to design something? How would an artist use it? How would a furniture maker use it? How would a stained glass artisan use it? How would a quilter use it? How would a, a, a tile setter use it to create mosaic patterns? The, how would a, a painter, an artist use it to set up a, a harmoni- harmoniously ordered campus? Campus, canvas, canvas. So that's kind of the approach. It's, it's like introduction. We're going to open the doors and invite you into the outer court of the Temple of Sacred Geometry. If you like there, we're going to be offering more advanced material 
into the fall and winter that will be available to people. So I think it's a hell of a good deal. And if you're interested in 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 understanding more about the the history of art, if you want to understand more about the ancient structures for found all over the world, one of the keys, sacred geometry. We find sacred geometry produces the template that underlies all of these great expressions of sacred architecture throughout the ages, whether it's Gothic cathedrals or temples in the Yucatan or temples in Cambodia or uh, stone circles in the British Isles or whether it's temples in Greece or Egypt. They're all working from the same template. And which raises lots them of people in- have a you know resistance they hear that word oh geometry oh you're remembering eighth grade or ninth grade math class right and uh, whatever that horrible teacher was that you had but this Dry, is, a, this, is a different, this is a different way of accessing the realm of geometry and it's it's fun it's interesting and it's going to work a new part of your brain and it's really a good thing to to get these initial steps and uh i really can't encourage enough you know, try it, try this out. It's worthwhile. And it opens up a whole new realm of understanding of the construction of, uh, you know, temples and yeah. places on earth, but the, the alignment of the planets and the solar system and the whole structure of the, the, the cosmos, uh, is spelled out in this, in this mass. So this is the starting point. And I, you know, the, the geometry, it it's awesome. Yeah. The geometry of a DNA helix, for example, Yep. And, and the process, the methodology is about integrating the hand, the eye, and the mind. So, and it's great for kids, too. Kids love it. Definitely. And it's a really cool thing for kids and parents to do together. So. All right. Yeah, man. So Did this will be after, the, this is after the live stream when you're seeing this. But the recorded version is available. Did you That's get right, Rowan? Did you get Rowan new to. new whittling tools? He told me he had like used his whittling knife all the way down to nothing making compasses. Is that what he said? <laughs> he did. He tell, I call him oh. every day. You know, we have to, <laughs> to find out. Which is just well, just mostly to talk about you and you know to oh, talk yeah. shit about you. Yeah, you know, it's good. It's got to be done. Well, yeah, he's been putting up with shit from me for <laughs> over six decades. How many compass, compasses do you think he's made? That's what I'm saying. I would guess total. Five to seven hundred, somewhere yeah. in that range. He needs a I new mean, whittling knife. That's what I'm saying. We sold well over three hundred over the old site, the site that um, I, you know, people, the one where you should not go and buy right. the yeah. sacred geometry class because <laughs> it's a ten-year-old unfinished beta version of the class. It's low quality. He's overcharging for it, and he's taking all the money. So put the word out: do not buy anything from sacred geometry international right and new new versions are coming soon yeah, so, yeah. don't donate to the site don't do anything and to support crazy, that he's, site he's bashing you as a freemason and he's still s- selling your material yeah well and does not even understand that without that number one freemasons have been major patrons of the site have donated to the site have bought the course right and even more importantly, there wouldn't even be sacred geometry if it wasn't for the craft, the Masonic craft. That, who, that is who has preserved this tradition for 400 years or so between, you know, the Middle Ages and the birth of modern science. Otherwise, you take that out, we wouldn't have access to this whole magnificent kingdom of which they have been the custodians and guardians. And the dumbass running that website doesn't even understand that while he's posting the most ridiculous conspiratorial videos that you could possibly even conjure up. Yeah, so to, so to be clear, and, and we've mentioned this on previous podcasts, but not in a while, Randall has no connection for the last almost four years at this point to Sacred Geometry International. There's been a, a rift um, Randall is not getting paid for the things that are sold there, the donations that are given there. So do not patronize that site. He continues to put out emails to sell those things and none of that's going to Randall. So, 
uh randallcarlson.com is the home for everything randall carlson um so please find your things there and wait for this new course because it's going to be a huge improvement over what's been offered there as randall said it's a beta version it wasn't even really supposed to be released but this guy just kind of just went off and pushed his own agenda and uh you know has 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 kept the profits from it without sharing with randall so it's uh pretty despicable and uh we're trying to get that news out there so i wanted to state that clearly once again thanks brad this is also the what'd you say brad third year anniversary of the publishing of the first cosmography episode that's right it's eight eight so that was that was the date Ah. of publishing of episode number one so yeah we're recording on on the third anniversary today i need to remember that because it's yeah so that's the day today which is the day we're recording it i don't know when it's gonna come out right yeah yeah, maybe a couple weeks behind, but yeah, it's our anniversary today. And oh, uh, happy anniversary, guys! So it's been if, a lot of uh, fun. You know, people that aren't subscribing, you know, they can't dig into the the two hour full podcast uh, mode. We are putting out clips now, so yeah. we have started on this three an- three year anniversary putting out short segments of prior podcasts in order starting with episode one which just came out a few days ago so we'll have a new playlist and those are going to be coming out pretty fast and furious because our buddy astrophotographer how tuber extraordinaire peter zelenka uh has a bit of time and he loves the material and he has the skills and he's digging in and i've sent him the files and he is he is pulling out the the clips for us to post so uh, you know, huge, huge props to Peter Zelenka. Check out his astrophotography free classes yeah. and for purchase classes. And actually, uh, it would have just been released. Uh, we did the, or they did the second, uh, episode of Randall reveals and Randall got into some, some basic sacred geometry. That's, uh, super fascinating and, uh, expose some of peter's astrophotography with the star trails and galaxies and nebulas and it's just really incredible photography that he teaches you the simple simple methods of how to create these uh photographs on your own with your semi semi basic camera according to him so uh that'll have been out at this point uh when this gets released also so lots of new material lots of stuff to dig into and lots of cool things that we're going to be doing moving forward and uh the big thing about that is those those digestible chunks people want to introduce this to your friend to their friends right and it's like i don't have two hours to dig into that you know what's the you know give me the the quickie version so now we're having the quickie versions you know send these links and share them with your friends and whoever you think would be interested this is the way to get them hooked uh the four from the first episode are are really grabbing and uh yeah this is going to be an important thing and uh step for us on this three year anniversary yeah and thanks to everybody who's donated their time to the cosmography of podcast and to randall's work in general um, no doubt just really appreciate everybody who's joined the team and all the work that they've been doing oh it's yeah been great thank you so much absolutely 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 well yes yeah nice bite-sized chunks now let me ask you this brad is this Will this podcast be uh, posted before our next Scablands expedition? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, we don't know. Maybe not, but maybe. By the time you hear this, maybe there are some last-minute seats available. I don't know. I can't predict the future, except within broad parameters, um, very broad parameters, but... Um, there may be. So if you, anybody is interested in getting in in this next Scablands trip, um, we'll have, uh, we're going to do, we're trying to do two versions of it. One with Brandon Powell, who does the Wim Hof work. Um, great guy. Um, drummer, we, he and I really enjoy uh, jamming on the drums together. Um, but he does the Wim Hof work, the breathing, and he's going to be the first week. And then the second week will be David Matheson. Um, with his star lore and we will be out under the magnificent skies of eastern washington hopefully clear nights the probabilities are good eastern washington is a 15 inch per year rainfall semi-arid so chances are good we'll have some good clear nights and uh we get out there under these wondrous skies and and um dave will be there with his high-powered thoroughly probably illegal laser pointer 
pointing out the stars and, of course, making sure that if a plane comes by, he turns it off. Because the one thing that, you know, we have several rules and guidelines. Uh, this is probably somewhere between a, a guideline and a rule. But one of the things is that we do not bring down airplanes out of the sky using high-powered lasers, military-grade lasers. So that's, if you read carefully the contract. Um, well, rule you, number one is don't get killed. Yeah, that's and rule number one. Close by is don't kill others yeah when don't you sign the else. waiver when you yeah. sign the waiver there's a checkbox there for don't bring airplanes down from the sky with high power lasers. <laughs> you will have to check that box in the know. waiver in right. order to come well, have to yes otherwise i'm sorry we just can't accommodate you, can't, you. that's right <laughs> and and even if it looks like it's full you're the last down to the the down to the last few people there's there's changes regularly people have to change their schedules and the beautiful thing is we're going again in March, excuse me, May, in the spring, where yeah. we went uh, earlier this year. Holy crap, that was last year, 21. You're only supposed to tell them that after oh, really? we've sold out. <laughs> I, I've lost I've lost time travel with this episode. Brad. Oh, we're going we're gonna to expect that it's sold out at this point. Yeah. And people need to get on the list yeah, for next Yeah, the point year's. is get on the list even if it is sold out. That's yeah, the thing. Sign there's up, another, there's take a trip, trip yeah. with Randall. They're awesome. People are mm. beyond awesome. Come on out with us. Yeah. And have your eyes opened to the the great epic tale that's engraved into the landscape of this planet. Yep. So, and get involved in some jam sessions, some drum circles. Oh, yeah. Some bonfires, some drum circles. Who knows? Yeah. We always try to include a few surprises and mix it up a little bit every trip. You know, yep. who knows what it could, might be a cave on one trip. It might be a hot spring on another trip. It might be just a totally awesome, great Mexican restaurant on another trip. Yep. Who knows? Um, it might be, it might be all of us, Russ, Kyle, myself, and a few others jamming out. Yep. That has been known to happen. That has been In known tokens. to happen. <laughs> uh, probably some really good eating, though. And uh, I think so. yeah, it's a great time. A, and a lot normal of guy Mike might be joining us. So we're trying to talk him into it. Mike, every time we do one of these, people are like, where's normal guy? That's right. So you got to You got to show up to at least one. I'm going to have to work on that. I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, because Mike, we see, really every time you guys go out like this, somebody winds up with COVID. And I've had COVID this year already. I don't want to know another dose. <laughs> You're good. Mike, You're clear. We're trying to every sell time. What here. do you mean every time? How many of these have we had? One time last <laughs> September. Remember? One out of five. Yeah. One out of five. You want to get some really okay. great antibodies, just come to the scablands with us. <laughs> so I got, if you want to boost up your T cells, come on out with us and <laughs> and do some jamming in the coolies. Yeah. Okay. All right. Main topic. I think we were promised. Storms, cyclones. Tornadoes. Oh, yeah, one of my favorite things. Yeah. You know, if I had a different career to do over again, I'd probably have to become a tornado chaser. Yeah, storm chaser would be great. Storm be chaser, fun. I know it, man. So, you know, I grew up in rural Minnesota, northwest of Minneapolis, kind of right on the edge of the tornado belt, if not right smack in the middle of the tornado belt. So there was quite a few tornadoes in my, uh, in my youth. There was a tornado in my head for a moment. Um, <laughs> no problem. Okay, good. Uh, so I've seen tornadoes. I've, I've sat there. I, we had a, a, a pipe in the back, a, a downspout pipe, that I used to use to climb up, and I would get up on the roof. And I'd love to get up and sit on the roof because it gave me a good view out across the lake that we live next to. I could see the rolling hills, and I got a great vista of the sky. So sometimes I used to just go up and sit on the roof of my house. So I was sitting on the roof of my house, and I think I, I think it was 14, maybe 15, but I think it was 14. Um, so I'm sitting up there, and I'm watching. As I'm, I'm facing north. I'm watching the clouds moving uh, from west to east. So from my left to right, they're moving, and the, the clouds were just very... It's strange looking. I remember looking at them. They looked very strange. They were kind of, you know, undulating and kind of rolling on themselves. Um, they were probably 
stratocumulus clouds. But anyways, I'm watching them, and I see on one of them this cloud coming down to a point, and it's and it's quite very light gray, or if not even white. And it was the a point, right, hanging down, and I'm thinking that looks like a baby tornado. And then behind it, not too far, another point funnel shape point came out of the bottom of the same cloud and they're moving along together the one that came out first is bigger and so there's two of them and they're gradually getting longer and longer as i'm watching them and then the front one made landfall it hit the ground and within seconds the whole cloud and funnel that i'd watched forming over the last i don't know half minute to minute turned dark gray because now it's sucking up all the stuff. And then pretty soon the second one comes down and so there's two of them. And I could watch the two of them moving across my field of view from left to right, from west to east, and moving along. And it just blew my mind. I was so excited. I want everybody else to see it. I mean, I think I probably literally leaped off the roof yelling, tornado, tornado. I don't remember if anybody else saw it. I might've been the only one. Uh, I don't remember if I, if anybody else was around or what. But so anyways, those two tornadoes, they were headed for a little, uh, a town called Fridley. If you go online, I should do that because the tornadoes wiped out half of Fridley. So I could probably actually pinpoint when this, the date when this happened, because I would imagine it's recorded somewhere when the town of Fridley, Minnesota got hit by the tornadoes. So that was one time. The second time, I didn't see the tornado, but because we were on a lake, the lake was kind of in a hollow. So to our east, there was a a rise in upland. To our west, it went. And we were kind of down in the basin. So I think this was after. I think this was maybe a year later. So this tornado is coming in from the west. You know, the storm warnings are out and um, nasty weather out. But this tornado comes in from the west and it wipes out a farm that was on the rise probably no more than a quarter to a third of a mile, of a mile to our west. It came and it left a path of destruction, wiped out this farm, and then what it did is it leaped over. It leaped over our house and set down on the prominence to our east and wiped out a couple of houses there. So we were like in the direct path of the tornado. And didn't, didn't really even know it till the next morning. I didn't know because the next day I'm going to school and the school bus comes to pick us up and it drives over the next crossroad where this farm was. And I look out there and the barn is completely, completely gone. And then out in the field, all of the, the siding boards and the planks and the lumber that had formed the barn was spread across the field. And the bizarre part of it was there had to have been dozens of planks and boards that had been shot into the ground, like literally buried with their ends into the ground and are sticking up out of the ground. So some weird turbulence or something took a bunch of these things and then shot them into the ground. But we were lucky. You know, really, and didn't know how lucky we were until the next day, really, when we saw, you could see the path to the tornado and took, and we were right in the path, but it popped over. But I do remember when it went over our house, you know, the passage of a tornado has often been described as being like multiple freight trains roaring by. And that really is what it was like. And the other bizarre thing is, is it was passing over, the pressure went way down. There was just like, like momentary huge pressure drop. And you got the feeling and the sound because it was almost like the tornado was trying to suck the house off its foundations. And you could feel the stress in the house for like 10, 15 seconds and the sound like of the straining lumber, like it was gonna get ripped off the foundations and that coupled with the sound of the tornado itself, it was wild. It was really wild. And, uh, And then the third meteorological event was we had been out all day bringing in hay bales from 
it was like a pasture of about maybe 80 acres, 100 acres, 80 acres. The farmer would grow alfalfa there, and then as the summer goes on, he would cut the alfalfa. He'd come by with the combine, roll it up into long strands, and then come by with the baler. And I don't know if you've ever seen the old-fashioned balers. You know, they're doing this, and you, they're, it's picking up the hay on the front end and spitting out hay bales on the back end. So then us boys, after the farmer, Harold, had been out there, and the field is now getting full of hay bales, we'd go out with another tractor and a trailer and start loading all those hay bales onto the trailer, take them back into to the barn and unload them in the barn, and by the end of the season, the barn is filled up to the rafters, and then that's the the feed for the livestock through the winter, right? So we'd been out all day getting these hay bales in. The, 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 the field was to the west of the farm, and we're coming in. The farm is just a part of it where it's kind of up on a knoll, and we're coming in, and as we're coming over the knoll, I look back to the west, and it's late in the day, so... You know, usually it's very typical, rural Minnesota, look to the west, you'll have these magnificent sunsets and skies and stuff. So I look back there and I see this cyclonic cloud and it's rotating, it's it's just rotating like this and it's huge coming over the horizon and it's white and it's almost like, if you've ever seen photos of the rings of Saturn, that's what it looked like. Like all these almost like tubules intertwined and kind of rolling around each other at the same time, the whole complex is rotating from my left to my right. And I yell at my buddy Hank, who's driving a tractor, and we stop and we look at it. And he goes, I better get the tractor in the barn. So he pulls the tractor in, and I'm standing there watching this thing just growing massively over the horizon. He comes back up, and we're standing there looking at it. and. About a mile and a half to our west, they were cutting in a road. And so the road had been, you know, they'd cut down the trees and the road was just barren and it had dry dirt there, right? Where they had, where they had clear cut the, the, the woods there. We're watching this cloud and all of a sudden, just like a wall, it hit this wind, this front, hit this road and instantly like it was a wall of dirt. And it's just kind of whirling around and coming at us. And what what struck me, the surprise to me was that how quickly it was between the wall of dirt when the, 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 the air mass hit the road and when it started hitting us. And we're up there, you know, it's summer, so we're just in like t-shirts or whatever. And it's got pebbles and so it's not just dust, it's pebbles and straw and probably all kinds of debris, twigs and stuff. That stuff hits us, man, and it was just a barrage of this stuff. And we start running for the shelter of the barn as fast as we can. And we're running, and we're kind of going down the hill, and there's a big white fence with a large gate open, but but the gate was closed. My friend Hank, he's running, and... All of a sudden, the gust comes in, and the last 20 feet or so, my friend Hank was not actually on the ground. He was being carried through the air and and hits the gate. And uh, we didn't even make it to the to the house, which is where we were headed. Next to the barn, you know, in the old, maybe they still do, the farms in the old days had the milk house, right? The milk house was usually half underground. It was built out of block or concrete, and it was where they would temporarily store the milk when they didn't have refrigeration available, right? So it's thick concrete walls with a little glass viewing poured out the door. We make it in there, the storm comes through. We didn't know then, but it was um, 80, 85 mile an hour winds, which is pretty serious. Um, And you literally couldn't see more than 10 feet 20 feet maximum out the window um, because there was so much debris in the air. So then when the storm finally abates, now it's, we stayed in there a long time. By the time it abates, the sun has gone down. It's getting dark. I go home. And uh, my grandfather had been building this boat 
And the boat had to be 25 feet long. It was a wooden fiberglass boat, and it was almost finished. He had the whole hull of it. It's all done and everything, all fiberglass layered. Next morning, we go out. My grandfather's boat is 30 feet up in the tree, sitting in the branches. So (laughs) I don't, I just can't remember how they managed to get the damn thing down from that tree. But I will never forget that. Oh, I ought to mention also that when that tornado went overhead, the other thing that happened was we had a, a neo-colonial house. So it had four, it had an overhang area in front of the, over the front door with four pillars. When the tornado went over, you know, and all of this, you know, it sounded like the whole house was going to get ripped off its foundations. We all ran as fast as we could for the basement. And of course, by the time we actually got to the basement, the tornado had already passed over. So, you know, we would have been dead anyway, but luckily, because it was passing over, it didn't rip the house off its foundation. But when we came back up in the living room, okay, you had the front wall, which faced the north, and windows, and on the far side of the room, there was a fireplace. One of the columns had been ripped off the front of the house, swirled around in the turbulence, and the end of it busted through the window, and it was it, one end was still hanging out the window, and the other end was sitting in the fireplace, in the fire pit, in the fireplace. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty wild. So anyways, my interest, that's the background, the context to my fascination and obsession with storms and weather and so on. I love the idea of climbing up on the roof to watch a tornado. Well, I didn't know, I, you know, <laughs> let me be clear. I didn't know I was going to see a tornado when I climbed up on the roof. I didn't know that. That was just like a surprise. But God, that was an exciting moment when I, I realized yeah. what I was looking at. Because, you know, I remember, oh God, when, when did they first relieve, re- release The Wizard of Oz to television, Mike? What year? Oh. It was in the 50s, <laughs> right? Was it in the 50s? Or was it later? No, no, it was in the 50s. I remember watching it as a little kid, of course, and being scared shitless by the witch. Of course. Right? But the thing that really stuck in my mind was the the, the animated sequence with the tornado. I wanted to see that over. And then when I heard they were going to show it again, I wanted to see it just so I could see the tornado again. Pretty damn cool, actually, the way they did that. And we won't get into that. But you remember? You've seen Wizard of Oz? Oh, yeah. I know you have. I'm talking to these other, you know, post. Um, what What is that? It was on once a year, but I I always fell asleep before it got this, to the man. It's in this the, in the story. Boxer. It's a story, Kyle, about a girl and her and her dog that gets swept away from Kansas. Toto. Boring. Toto. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> yes, and, I've seen yeah, we've, we've seen we've, the way we've seen it. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Of and course. so, of course, back in the it, it, you know in back in the day, it was considered a metaphor for the whole you know what experience, right? Yeah. Okay. As was what was the other one? Oh, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah, why knew is that. that while you're playing Dark Side of the Moon? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay. And what's we, supposed to happen? Puff the magic we dragon. We saw that one on like public access, right? We probably grew up with less TV than you had, Randall, in yeah. your childhood, because we, you know, we we had public access channels, and we were rural, so we, most of those didn't oh. even work. So it was uh, we saw a fuzzy, staticky version probably when we were kids because we oh, played, okay. played that movie sometimes. But of course, I've seen it since then. But yeah, so that yeah. explains your cultural deprivation. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. get it now. It was okay. on purpose. We spent yes. <laughs> We spent time in the woods not watching TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Normal Judy Garland well, experience. okay, so you guys were in the woods. I was up on the roof. Okay. Yeah, right. I didn't watch that much TV, but, you know, hey, I have the vaguest memory, and I think I was three years old, my dad bringing home our first ever TV. Yeah. Bringing in it, carrying in the box. Everybody's excited. You know, we got we finally got a television, and unboxing it. I can actually remember little bits and snippets of that, and I was probably only three years old. But our first TV, because it was such a big deal. But yeah, 
I mean, I watched a lot of TV in the 50s and 60s, but by the time I got about 16, I moved on to other things. I didn't, after that, I know a little bit about like late 60s and 70s television, but not much. 80s, not much. 90s, not much. If you want to talk about TV in the 50s or the 60s, man, I got it. I got, a, got it. a whole file. <laughs> I can pull it open. I've got the file folders in there. Which one do you want? You know. All the westerns, right? Oh, yeah, all the great westerns. But it's weird to think about because you go back, we're talking 60 years ago, right? In the 50s, there was as much time between the end of the frontier and the, the cowboy days as it was up to that point, as has transpired since then. Right? Yeah, true. That's, that's bizarre to think. But just like it's bizarre to think about, we've been doing this for three years as of today. It is. I refuse. I refuse to believe that. I just, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to believe that it's been three years. Well, well you date, are, yeah, the and date, if you go back 60 sorry. years ago, it's the 60s. <laughs> the, the date is 8-8, and this is actually episode 88. So how did that work out? Oh, my God. Brad, Brad, you've been planning this for months, haven't you? Um, I'm the, the guy the guy behind the scenes in Oz. Ah, you're that guy. The, okay. The lever puller. So, so we, have, we have other storm stories. Mike, Brad, you guys have any short ones? Mike, you must have had a storm story. I know Mike's got some. Mine are brief. Well, Minor brief, you know, hurricane in Biloxi in the early 50s and uh, blizzards in Alaska. It's, you know, usual stuff. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. That's just normal stuff. Just normal, like, yeah, <laughs> blizzards in Alaska. Didn't we have, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I that, say, you know, normal for many, many folks living in Georgia. Yeah. All of our listening, listeners you know, in Florida. Sta standard Atlanta blizzard in Alaska story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all. So I will say, yeah, on the, on the Weather Channel, they've done uh, top ten countdowns of the worst tornadoes in the in the U.S. Right, so there was one in nineteen thirty mm -hmm. thirty six, mm -hmm. which was a, a cra crazy hot year to start with. Lots of uh, records mm -hmm. are still go back to nineteen thirty six. We are uh, going to actually talk about that, Brad. Yeah, if I don't, we, okay, if, I don't if doubt we quit, that. If we quit screwing around and get down to business Bantering here. Bantering a bit. So, yeah, my mom was like a month old uh, ah. when that when that uh, tornado came through northern Georgia. And, uh, you know, she was just always freaked out by the weather, would hide from storms. She was totally addicted to the weather channel, you know, anytime ah. there was hurricanes and stuff. So I kind of picked up on some of that. So I'm, I'm intrigued by, you know, that was some of my early... Uh, awareness of paying attention to the cycles of the planet and the weather and oh, the extremes yeah. and you know i was i was aware aware of that could because she was so scared of it yeah well i figured she must have be that time when we heard that the thunder those peals of thunder and you went and ran and hid under the covers <laughs> i was i knew there had to have been a story behind that wasn't me was it you? I had just the opposite of your mom. If it was a storm, I wanted to run out and climb up on the freaking roof. Yeah, I'm, you I'm, know? Out, I'm out ah! there like trying to zap the lightning. Okay, yeah. zoom, go. <laughs> that was me. Okay, so let's talk about, start about, we'll talk about some hurricanes. Cyclonic storms, hurricanes are certainly in the category of cyclonic hurricanes. Now, this is an interesting study came out back in 1996. Now, in 1996, you got to keep in mind, here's what's happening. IPCC has put out its first report four years earlier. Um, the agenda, the climate, the global warming, because back then they're still calling it global warming, the global warming agenda is just taking shape. 1988, you know, James Hansen uh, gave that presentation to... Congress in the middle of July, the hottest day of the summer, him and a Confederate or somebody, uh, oh, the, I'll think of the guy's name, one of the Democratic congressmen went in the night before, turned the air conditioner off, so the air conditioner wasn't working, and you've got all everybody assembled there, and of course they're sweating profusely, it's hot as hell in there, 
and James Hansen is delivering this spiel about global warming, right? Planned right from the beginning. You know, we're going to set this thing up a little bit of theater here. Let's turn the air conditioner off, get it good and hot for everybody. So they're all sweating when Hansen puts out his, you know, global warming fear scenario. So what happened then is they created the IPCC. They came out with their first report in 1992. And I'm going to be talking about that in an upcoming podcast because we're going to look at how how their reports and their slant on the climate change uh, issue evolved over the next two report cycles. So 1996, same year as this, was the, the second report. Some interesting things happened, um, particularly the 1996 IPCC intro- report introduced the hockey stick graph, which is something we need to talk about. You've he- heard of the hockey stick graph, right? Which oh, yeah. basically yeah. showed the last ho- showed the Holocene essentially more or less flat, and then boom, right at the end, whomp, it takes this big, huge sweep upwards. Al Gore made very prominent use of the hockey stick graph in his Inconvenient Truth. Okay, so at some point, we're going to revisit that and look at where that hockey stick graph came from. Um, Because the previous, in 1992, the same graph for the same time span, for the same, uh, you know, same y-axis distribution, showed a completely different situation. It showed the Little Ice Age. It showed the medieval warm period. It showed the, the, the Holocene climatic optimum. It showed the Roman warm period. And... To compare these two graphs is very instructive, and I'm not going to pull that up tonight. Like I said, we'll, we'll address that in another episode. But what happened with the hockey stick is this got flattened out, and the end got turned up like this. And it's a statistical manipulation, and once you understand how it was done, it was quite ingenious, actually. But it was a statistical mani- manipulation, and, and I think we'll have some time. We're going to look at some statistical manipulations tonight. We'll look at a a statistical manipulation that was conducted with regards to tornado data, for example. And again, it's, you know, it's pretty clever the way they've done it, but if you dive into it, you can see exactly what they did. And we're going to look at that. Anyway, so this, this report came out in Geophysical Research Letters in 1996. Christopher Lancey, one of the world's foremost experts on hurricanes, acknowledged on all fronts. Uh, William Gray, another expert, hurricane expert. It was a collaborative effort uh, with four, four authors. Here is the title of the paper, which appeared in Geophysical Research Letters. Downward trends, get that? Downward trends in the frequency of intense Atlantic hurricanes during the past five decades. So this is just some quotes out of that paper. There is concern that the enhanced greenhouse effect may be affecting extreme weather events such as tropical cyclones. The North Atlantic Basin offers reliable long-term records of tropical cyclone activity. The most recent years of 1991 through 1994 have experienced the quietest tropical cyclone activity of record in terms of frequency of tropical storms, hurricanes, and intense hurricanes. This was followed by the 1995 hurricane season, one of one of the busiest in the past 50 years. Despite 1995's activity, a long-term or five-decade downward trend continues to be evident primarily in the frequency of intense hurricanes. In addition, the mean maximum intensity averaged over all cyclones in a season has decreased while the maximum intensity attained by the strongest hurricanes 
each year has not shown a significant change. Now, that was the case in 1996. In summary, contrary to many expectations that globally tropical cyclones may be becoming more frequent and or more intense due to increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases, regionally, the Atlantic Basin has in recent decades seen a significant trend of fewer intense hurricanes and weaker cyclones overall. In addition, the maximum intensity reached in each year has shown no appreciable change. These trends have been accentuated in recent hurricane seasons, 1991 to 1994, with the lowest frequencies recorded of tropical storms, hurricanes, and intense hurricanes in the 50-year period of accurate counts. The countries surrounding the Caribbean have particularly benefited as five years with no hurricanes in the region is the strongest, is the longest hurricane-free span since the turn of the century. However, 1994, 1995 has at least temporarily heralded the return of Atlantic Basin hurricanes. Most of the regional, regional and global factors which previous research has shown to be related to active Atlantic hurricanes, hurricane seasons, were present during 1995. It is possible that this sharp increase of activity was a consequence of an increase in the strength of the oceanic thermohaline circulation. It will likely take several more years before it can be established whether 1995 was simply a single year anomaly in continued quiet conditions, or whether it was the beginning of a regime of active hurricane seasons. Now, do you know what happened? For the next, what was it, 11 or 12 years, not a single hurricane made landfall? First time that's ever happened. It's the longest period where no hurricanes have made landfall in the U.S. Now, Hurricanes have come back somewhat, and we're going to look at a graph in a minute that that plots the totality of uh, cyclonic activity, both in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, The big ones I remember was Andrew was 92, right, Mm -hmm. came into Miami, and then the next really big one I remember was was Katrina, I guess, was 2005, so that's 13 years there. But yeah, 10 year with no landfalls, yeah, that's, that's hard to imagine. Yeah. Sorry, Russ. So why why is the landfall a a factor? Like don't you why, Well, it's why not you so just... much a factor, but when you have a lot of hurricanes, you have more of them making landfall. Okay. That's the point. You, you increase just... the number if you de- decrease the more hurricanes, the greater probability one of them is going to hit sure. hit land. Sure. It doesn't really Now, of course, once hurricanes do hit land, that's what they dissipate. They once disperse, they're Yeah. They right. disperse, right? But not before they can cause a lot of damage. I've just, I've just wondered because I've heard that you know no hurricanes making landfall, but I'm like, well, okay, but how many were there? You know, don't they? They still can take place out there in the ocean, right? Oh hell yeah, yeah, of course. And and, and yeah, I and mean, we could probably find examples if we go through there of them hitting islands. And, yeah, sure. Yeah. But the point is, here's the point. If you reduce the total number of hurricanes, you reduce the possibility or probability of any of them making landfall. Right. It just you increase like the number. Of, so, so it's just another indication of a reduced frequency of hurricanes. Okay. So now we're going to jump forward to November 12th, 2008. Now, this is a, an article that appeared in USA Today, but it's still basically factual. This is 2008. The past two years have seen a remarkable downturn in hurricane activity, contradicting predictions of more storms, researchers at Florida State University say. The 2007 and 2008 hurricane seasons had the least tropical activity in the Northern Hemisphere in 30 years, according to Ryan Maui, co-author of a report on global tropical cyclone activity. Quoting Maui, 
Even though North Atlantic hurricane activity was expectedly above normal, the western and eastern Pacific basins have produced considerably fewer than normal typhoons and hurricanes. Maui's results dovetail with other research suggesting hurricanes are variable and unconnected to global warming predictions, said Stan Goldenberg, a hurricane researcher with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and then, here's a quote from him. The simplistic notion that warmer oceans from global warming automatically lead to more frequent and or stronger hurricanes has not been verified. Said Goldenberg, whose research points to periods of high and low hurricane activity that last several decades each. Maui used a measurement called the accumulated cyc cyclone energy, or ACE, A-C-E, accumulated cyclone energy, which combines a storm's duration and its wind speed in six-hour intervals. The years 2007 and 2008 had among the lowest ACE measurements since reliable global satellite data was first available three decades ago. Northern Hemisphere activity in 2006 was close to average in the previous two years, 2004, 2005, which included hurricanes Katrina and Rita, saw among the highest numbers. It tells you, quoting Maui again, that from year to year you have large swings of activity. Said Maui, who plans to present his work next month at a meeting of the American Geophysical Union in San Francisco. He finally concludes and says this, if you want to find a global warming signal in all that data, it's generally going to be rather small. Now, let's look at a graph of accumulated cyclonic energy. See if I can pull this over here. We're yeah. semi due for a break, so if you get a transition point here, we can. Well, I tell you take what, let's break. go ahead, take the break, then we'll come back and we'll. I'll have a do graph a ready. Screen. Yep, we'll do a share screen and we'll dive into some of these graphs. They're pretty interesting. You guys good with that? Excellent. We'll Good deal. Right. And be right back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And we are getting right back into the subject matter here. Randall was uh, about to show us a graph of the ACE, Accumulated Cyclone, cyclone <laughs> Energy. Yes. Uh, okay, so this one goes back to the, the, what I was just sharing. I'm going to, um, quoting from Maui, and, uh, where it says uh, he... Uh, he plans to present his work next month at a meeting of the American Geophysical Union. And so this is basically, this graph that I'm going to share here shows the uh, total. Now notice there's, there's a lot of data points forming one curve, and that's the global. That's global. And then the second one down here using the green uh, squares is just northern hemisphere. Now you can see down here on the x-axis, we're going back to almost 1979 and coming forward to just beyond, not quite to uh, 2010. So between 1979 and 2010, you can see that there were two peaks of intense hurricane activity. And they kind of came in the mid-90s, and then there was a major drop-off. Then there was another peak, and then since then it's been dropping off. To so where it stood in nineteen, I mean, yeah, in two thousand and nine, was basically at the same level of intensity and frequency as in nineteen eighty. Okay, that's one thing this graph shows. So this is like shows here the twenty four month running sums, 
Um, okay, here we go. Updated through June 29th, 2009. And here's the, the y-axis is, is the uh, accumulated cyclone energy. We'll go to the next graph. Here it is carried up to 2016. Uh, and it's been extended into the past. The previous one ended at 79. This one, look, has been pushed back to 1972. So it says here, here's the last four decades of global and northern hemisphere accumulated cyclone energy. Note that the year indicated represents the value of ACE through the previous 24 months for the northern hemisphere, which is the bottom line. Uh, and the entire global, uh, the area in between represents the southern hemisphere total accumulated uh, cyclone energy. So you notice, of course, there's going to be more total accumulated cyclone energy when you're talking about the whole planet rather than just the northern hemisphere, right? That's exactly what you'd expect. However, you'll see how the two graphs, I mean, they're following each other very, very close. And you'll see what's happened is if, as after that downturn that we saw happening here in 2009, 2010, we see that it started an uptick again. So there's a, it's, it's gone up a, a fair amount here. Um, you'll notice here the, the accumulated cyclone energy in terms of knots. So each, each of these represents uh, 10 to the fourth or 10,000 knots. Okay, K-N-O-T-S. While we're looking, you could, uh, while we're going here, uh, Kyle, maybe you could look that up and we'll, in a minute you can give us okay. the definition of, of a knot. That's K-N-O-T, right? So now we've come up to 2016. Well, let's go to the next one. Well, we've come up a couple more years. We're getting up to uh, like 2019 right here. Uh, let's see almost to 2019, that's updated the 31st of October, 2018. So what you can see is that uptick that we saw in the previous one is it began to go back down. And, and then there's another uptick you can see happening right here. But still, uh, you can see that from this peak back here in the early 90s, each of the successive peaks seems to be getting lower, okay? But you get down here to this, it's pretty much within what you would consider a normal range. Go one more. Here's up to the, almost to the present. Okay, so here's global major hurricane frequency, the 12-month running sums, updated July 31st. So this is just like one year ago. All hurricanes greater or equal to 64 knots. Right? So according to Wikipedia, knot is... Uh, 1.151 miles per hour. Okay, so let me do a quick, uh, a quick calculation here, very quick. Okay. okay, so you said again, what was I couldn't remember the exact number, so that's why I should One, look it up. 1.151 miles per hour. Okay, so if we're looking at 64 knots, then we're looking at 73 miles an hour. So this is all hurricanes. Uh, greater than 73, almost 74 miles, where the wind is at least 74 miles an hour. Well, that's not even a hurricane. That's like where a hurricane starts. They're, that's where like it starts, yeah. But then you've got 74 miles an hour, I think. Yeah. Well, that's that's what this is. 64 knots is the 74, right? So that's just, that's why it's saying all hurricanes. Major yeah. hurricanes, 96. So what do you say? 1.151? Yes, sir times 96 so that brings us up to 110 so something over 110 miles per hour is considered a major hurricane so here you go here's your major hurricanes here's all hurricanes and of course when you're including these lower intensity hurricanes there's going to be more of them right um and over here uh you see the major hurricanes now look at the line as you're going across here between 1980 and last year, is there a trend? Has there, do you see an upward trend? Do you see an upward trend in all hurricanes? No, in fact, we haven't, like we haven't uh, equaled the peak. I do not. 
of, of you know, back to 97, 98. It looks fairly static or even a little bit down. Or even a little bit down. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same with major hurricanes. Now, there's, here's this peak, but then it came back down, and this is where it sits. Now, here we are, getting up towards the middle of August. Where's the hurricanes? Right? We had any major hurricanes? Yeah. I don't think this so. This season, no, not really. This no. year. So you see, we can we can actually, if we this is this is updated basically a little over a year ago, and what have we seen in the subsequent year? Well, we're all ready to the eighth of August, and where's the hurricanes? We're well into the hurricane season. Peak is like September tenth. Yeah, so we've got you know some time ahead of us, but we'll just see how it plays out. But you can see here, you can look at either one of these two graphs and tell me if you see an upward trend over the last 42 years. It ain't there. Nope. Nope. It ain't there. And that's why if we go back Propaganda. to this quote, what we see here, uh, yeah, the years 2000, 2008 had among the lowest ACE measurements since reliable global satellite data was first available. Um, and as Maui says right here, it tells you that from year to year, you have large swings of activity. And that's what we're seeing right there in the graph. Uh, so uh, I wonder how much that those hurricane graphs would correlate to like solar cycle activity. Ooh, that's a good question. And that's a topic worth diving into at some point. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're not seeing that there's anything, at least if we look at the last 40 years, there's nothing out of, you know, that's so so outlying. There's, there's no increase in either intensity or in frequency in this data. Um, in fact, you know, as it says here, uh, they're already noting back in, in 1996, Contrary to many expectations that globally trop tropical cyclones may be becoming more frequent and or more intense, uh, regionally the Atlantic Basin has in recent decades seen a significant trend of fewer intense hurricanes and weaker cycles cyclones overall. You know, this is talking about the Atlantic. Now we saw a graph that was the global, but w what's going on in the Pacific? Let's see if we can... Uh, Let me stop share for the moment. Uh, go back to, let me get this open here. We'll go look, we've got a graph. Here's a graph. Uh, the number of typhoons. Now, this is put out by uh, Japanese researchers who are tracking typhoons. And this is a the number of typhoons in the Pacific, uh, 1951 through 2021. And let me just, this is on their website. Let me uh, share a screen here. Here we go. There's the graph. Same thing. Uh, this is data from the Japan Meteorological Agency for the number of typhoons formed in the Pacific in the month of July. Now that the July data are available, where's the trend? Is there a, a, a pronounced upward trend in cyclonic activity in the Pacific Ocean? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it, no. Now this is going back 1951, so this is 70 years. Right? Shouldn't we be seeing an upward trend if what they're saying is true? You know, well, the, you know, um, it's the same old litany. Let's see, I got this quote. I couldn't, I couldn't help it um, uh, that I'm going to read to you because this is Kamala Harris. This, is, this was what she said in some kind of a news conference or something a few days ago. For years, our nation, and as many have discussed, have lamented, 
have talked about the threat of climate change. For years, we debated the potential impact that climate change could have on our communities, on our country, and our world. And today, we know the impact if folks weren't clear about it before. Just watch the evening news and see that the time for debate is long past. Climate change has become a climate crisis and a threat that has now become a reality. In recent days, deadly floods have swept through Missouri and Kentucky, washing away entire neighborhoods, leaving at least 35 dead, including babies, children. As has been reported, four children from one family. So, the devastation is real, the harm is real, the impact is real, and we are witnessing it in real time. And the debate is long over, as she says, so there's no point in discussing any of this. The science has settled. We know that storms are increasing in frequency and intensity, right? Floods are increasing. Tornadoes are increasing, right? Old wildfires are increasing. Droughts are increasing. What else? Everything bad you can think of, pretty much, it's being claimed is increasing in frequency. Heat waves, cold spells, oh, cold spells, right? Don't, we can't leave that out, right? Well, we just saw some actual, if we wanna you know, do what they say, oh, follow the science, well, we just did. We just followed some science and we discovered that, at least as far as hurricanes go, nothing out of the ordinary is happening. In fact, if anything, the trend has gone down somewhat. The number, the numbers of maximum intensity hurricanes has actually trended down. Well, to what do you attribute that cause? I don't know. Is it something, the sun, you brought that up. That's a good question. Well, is it carbon dioxide? Well, it couldn't be carbon dioxide, right? Because carbon dioxide is supposed to be causing warming of the troposphere, and that's supposed to increase the intensity of hurricanes, right? Unless somehow the computer modelers got it ass backwards, and the carbon dioxide is actually in causing the intensity and frequency of storms to decrease, which I'm not claiming to be the case. But right now, the debate is over model doesn't explain the, the, the graphs we just saw of hurricanes. So let's look at some tornadoes if we have time. We do. We do. Okay, Absolutely. cool. Let's look at some, some tornadoes. Now, I've written some things, and I think it would be a good succinct uh, if I just just kind of paraphrased what I wrote, maybe with some skip a few parts, maybe uh, add a few addendums here and there. Um, and I wrote this back in December of 2021. So as I was writing that, Remember COP twenty six that happened that was got all the all the uh, fanfare and and all the newsworthy headlines about the the conference of the parties twenty six that was going to you know solve the climate crisis and so you had delegates coming from all over the world going to Glasgow Scotland for their pointless gab fest that really had nothing much to do with actual climate science and everything to do with politics and the redistribution of wealth from the richer countries, primarily the United States, to covetous, covetous third world nations that are more than willing and happy to be bribed for their support of the narrative of climate crisis. So, 400 private jets ferrying the climate crisis elite to the conference, emitting over 13,000 tons of carbon dioxide in the process. 
and Joe Biden displaying his green credentials for all the world to see, uh, arrived via Air Force One. And, you know, he just recently, a couple of days before, been visiting Pope Francis. I don't know if you remember that, Pope Francis in, in Rome. So when Joe Biden, who's now Air Force One over to Glasgow to, you know, participate in the climate crisis, he, several days before, arrived to have a meeting with the Pope. And, you know, he only needed 85 gas-guzzling SUVs for his motorcade. And uh, he himself was transported in the Beast. You might know about the Beast, the $1.5 million, 244-horsepower Cadillac that views 10 times more carbon than a typical SUV driven by the rest of us plebes. So Biden met with Pope Francis for 75 minutes, and the original plan, if you probably don't recall this, but the original plan was they were going to broadcast this live on TV. But somebody decided as the moment approached that it would be best not to put Joe Biden up on live TV (laughs) talking with the Pope for 75 minutes. Uh, Okay, so um, with that as background, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, also called NOAA, N-O-A-A, the website under the section entitled The National Centers for Environmental Education. Information, sorry, information. There's a graph that it depicts a very clear upward trend in the U.S. in U.S. tornadoes between the year 1950 and 1921. Okay. So what do you got? 71 years there, right? I'll repeat what I just said. There's a graph. 1950 to 2021? Yes. Okay. Uh, So there's a graph depicting a very clear upward trend in American U.S. tornadoes in the 70 years between 1950 and 1921. Uh, And 50 was as far back as NOAA's Storm Prediction Center database went. So they went all the way back. And this graph is quite frequently put out there. It's, you know, you go to the, uh, whichever section of the NOAA website this is, I guess, the, yeah, the National Center for Environmental in- Information. Under tornadoes, the graph I'm about to show you is the graph you're gonna see. So it's it's frequently employed to, employed to bolster the contention that there is evidence for increasing frequency and intensity of storms, okay? So let me now share that graph all right, so here we go. Go back to 1950. Come back down to 2021. Well, here, I mean, it's pretty clear cut, isn't it? Man, the tornadoes are getting, they're getting way more of them now than there used to be. That's pretty clear. You got an upward trend here. Pretty unmistakable, right? Certainly isn't a downward trend. Right. Right. I wouldn't say it's stable either. It's clearly showing that the number, you know, these tornadoes are increasing. So if you go, and in fact, you know, in the mainstream media, you've seen this, you can see this graph. Uh, It's both in print media, online, and in, uh, uh, what I say, print media, online, and on on television. It's, It's been all over the place. And clearly, it does seem to bolster the claim that frequency of these awful storms is increasing. But as I say underneath here, however, there's a problem with this graph. It is a cleverly manipulated fraud. So let's take a closer look. Okay, here we go. Okay, so... I'm just going to give a little background and context, and then we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, so there are currently about 1,200 tornadoes on average. Get that. You'd probably never imagine that it was this many. 1,200 tornadoes on average are recorded each year in the United States. The intensity of tornadoes is classified according to the Fujita scale, now called the F scale. It's after Fujita, Fujita was a meteorologist or scientist who developed, let's see, oh yeah, developed by T. Theodore Fujita, introduced in 1971, 
in a paper entitled Proposed Characterizations of Tornadoes and Hurricanes by Area and Intensities. So Fujita's goal, uh, goals were to provide a system of classification that included both the area affected by the tornado as well as its intensity and through analysis of the damage caused to estimate its maximum wind speed. So the scale starts at F0 with wind speeds less than 73 miles per hour. Typical damage of F0 tornadoes includes branches knocked off trees, signboards damaged, trees with shallow roots knocked over. F1 tornadoes range in wind velocity from 73 to 112 miles per hour. Winds of this intensity can rip shingles off of roofs, push over mobile homes, and blow moving autos off of roads. Damage is referred to as moderate. At wind speeds of 113 to 157 miles per hour, F2 damage is considerable with roofs torn off of frame houses, boxcars overturned, cars lifted off the ground and large trees uprooted or broken. An F3 tornado can have wind speeds up to 206 miles per hour and associated damage is referred to as severe. A wind in this range of intensity can overturn boxcars, uproot most trees in a forest, demolish mobile homes, and completely rip the entire roof off of a framed house. From 207 up to 260 miles per hour, wind speeds in the F4 classification, the damage is classed, classified as devastating. The force of a wind this powerful can level even well-built homes, and cars can be picked up and hurled through the air. Finally, the damage of an F5 category of tornado is described as incredible. In this velocity range, entire houses can be swept away. Automobiles are turned into missiles that can be thrown hundreds of feet. Bark can be stripped from trees by the intense cheering forces. Okay, with all this in mind, let's refer back to the graph and note that only the number of tornadoes is depicted. Okay, so let's go back to the graph. Now, notice the 1991-2010 average tornado count. And you've got a count of the tornadoes, but nowhere in this graph is it telling you the intensity of the tornado, is it? No, it's not. No, just the number, yeah. Just the number of tornadoes. And you can see over the y-axis here, you see those numbers. And you can go back, oh my gosh, back in 1950 at the first one, there was only 200. But, you know, now you come up and, oh my God, there's 1,400 of them. Or even, what's this, 1,600? It's a lot of damn tornadoes, isn't it? So, but note that. Note that, that in this graph, you've got numbers, but not intensity. You don't have the category of the tornado, okay? With all this in mind, refer back to the graph and note that only the total number of tornadoes is depicted, not their categorization according to the F scale. We have no way of telling from this graph the power of the tornadoes or their classification. This graph does not tell you how many actual tornadoes have incurred, have occurred since 1950. I'll repeat that. This graph does not tell you how many actual tornadoes have occurred since 1950. It tells you how many have been documented and recorded. This distinction is critical to the deception. So let's back up a bit. Okay, so a number of factors have changed considerably in the 72 years since 1950. Let's think about those factors. The Midwest region, where the majority of tornado sightings are concentrated, has become more densely populated over the decades, right? What does that mean? 
Well, it means that there are more eyes to witness and hence report the occurrence of tornadoes. But this isn't the critical factor here. Technological advancements have made the detection of tornadoes much more effective. So I'll refer here to, to NOAA's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's website, where you can, it used to be up there, I don't know if it still is, and its own explanation of what has changed. After mentioning the 1,200 tornado per year U.S. average, the site goes on to let the cat out of the bag. And here's the quote directly. The number of tornadoes increased dramatically in the 1990s. And that's what we would see if we went back and looked at the graph once more, one more time. The number of tornadoes increased dramatically in the 1990s as the modernized National Weather Service installed the Doppler radar network. The National Weather Service modernization also began the Warning Coordination Meteorologist Program, increasing partnerships with media and emergency management across the United States. This program also initiated the training of storm spotters across the county warning area of each weather forecast office. With more people trained to relay information on storm activity to the weather forecast office and improved communication and digital technology, more tornadoes could be reported. So going back and looking at the graph, there was a dramatic jump in tornado reporting just after 1990 and you can see that jump in gra- in in the graph. I'll go back one Doppler more time. Radar. So you're so I guess that the upshot here is that the the apparent increase in this graph that doesn't show us the power of the storms but just counts the number is an artifact of reporting. That's what you're talking about. It's Abs- purely an artifact of reporting and, and technology and the ability to report. Yes, because what's okay. happening now is you've got many many more tornadoes being counted and reported and sure. documented. Yeah. And and right here, look at 1990. Right here is the deployment of Doppler radar. You want to share the graph with us again? Oh, sorry. Yep. And they can be a lot more accurate about what's just over 73 or 74 miles an hour. Yeah. It's a strong wind and no, well, actually, we can monitor that a little more closely. And that does count as a F0. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, look right here. See the see this dramatic upswing right there as you get into the nineties? Yep. Right there. That's the deployment of Doppler radar. Okay. So there are there probably are real spikes in there. Oh sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely there's real yeah. spikes. What yeah. we're interested in though is the trend. Sure. That's yes. what we're really going for here. So let's it's just I was thinking the same with the hurricane. It's like, you know, we can we can we can uh, get, say, temperature information from a long time ago using ice cores and proxies, but it's difficult to find. You can't get storm information from uh, tests like that. You know, how are you going to count the number of hurricanes in a year by looking at, like, ice core information or something like that? Can't do it. So all of our hurricane or storm information is just recent. So it's difficult to even get trends in that, long-term yes. ones anyway. Like what would be the, you know, what would, it would be interesting to be able to see what was the hurricane count during like the little ice age. We just don't know. Oh, we're going to do, well, we do know some things. We know some things. Oh, we know some things and we are going to dive into that. And these are some pretty extraordinary stories. Oh yeah. You know, I've seen things where they just, you know, they're pointing it out. There's, they've got the radar, right? And they're like, well, see this comma shape. That's a bow echo. That's a tornado. And there might not be yeah. anybody on the ground that's aware of that. There's nobody's house there, whatever. Right. But they pick it up on the radar, and that's the signature, so they count that one. Yeah. And it may have no, you know, effect or obser- observers or anything. But, okay, well, radar radar indicated, uh, even if it's very short-lived. Exactly. You know, they count it. So, let me go on. The dramatic jump in tornado reporting just after 1990, can be seen clearly in graph number one, the one we just looked at. So with the new reporting procedures, 
it even became unnecessary for someone to actually witness the tornado because damage assessments conducted by the National Weather Service can determine whether the damage was caused by a tornado and from that analysis determine how strong the tornado was in terms of wind speed. A report presented at the annual meeting of the American Geophysical Union in 2013 addressed the effect of the improved reporting methodologies. Quoting from the National Climatic Data Center, the report explains that, quote, with increased Doppler radar coverage, increasing population, and greater attention to tornado reporting, there has been an increase in the number of tornado reports over the past several decades. This can create a misleading appearance of an increasing trend in tornado frequency. End of quote. That's directly from the National Climatic Data Center, that uh, annual meeting of the American Ge- Geophysical Union. So you want to talk about following the science? Well, yeah, we'll do that. We're going to do that. Yeah, we're going to follow the science. I think that's up here in Nashville. We need to go visit them. Yeah. This can create a misleading appearance of an increasing trend in tornado frequency. So, as I like to point out, as we head into 2022, we've got to recognize that there are agenda-driven individuals who are perfectly willing to let people be misled. Um, And here's one other thing that we need to mention. Prior to the mid-1970s, very few F-Zero tornadoes were even recorded. With the improved detection and reporting systems, more and more of these minimal storms became part of the database. All of these factors taken together create the impression that the absolute numbers of tornadoes have been on the increase when, in reality, the increase is only an artifact of the processes of data collection. So now we're going to take a quick look at two other graphs. These graphs used to be on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website. Either shortly before or after the inauguration of Joe Biden, (laughs) these two graphs disappeared. But we still got them. They're still out there. But they're not the kind of thing you're going to see if you're just doing superficial research. Okay, so the first graph I'm going to show you shows the annual count of tornadoes from 1954 through 2014 from a graph which was disappeared from the NOAA site. So what I want you to note when you see this graph is that it does include F1 tornadoes and stronger, but does not include tornadoes in the F0 category, which were included. And of course, the remember this, the, the weaker the storm, the smaller the storm, the more no, raw numbers there are of the, of the lesser storms, right? And as you go up through intensity and power, you get this falling off graph that the extreme events are going to be rare events. The, the smaller borderline, they're going to be much more frequent, right? So now, it used to be that, the, as, as, as I'm saying here, that uh, the F0 tornadoes were not even counted, before like 1990. Okay, so note that this does include, this next graph includes F1 tornadoes and strongers, but does not include tornadoes in the F0 category. So here is the annual count, U.S. annual count of F1 plus tornadoes 1954 through 2014. So let's take a look at it. Here's your annual count on the y-axis, and here's your year on the x-axis. So this is your time axis, and this is your uh, raw numbers. Take a look. If you were going to draw a trend line in here, what would it do? Pretty much hasn't changed. There's basically, the trend line is basically flat. Since 1954 to 2014. 
So what do we got there? 70 years. No trend in tornadoes F plus one or greater. No trend. There it is. This is the raw data. It's right on the government's own websites, even though this particular graph mysteriously disappeared recently. But here it is. Now, does this graph look look at all like the one we just looked at? No, it doesn't. No. So now, I've got one more graph here to look at. This next graph depicts the number of tornadoes of intensity F3 or stronger from 1954 to 2014. In contrast to the weaker storms included in graph two above, the strong to violent tornadoes actually show a very clear decline in trend. And there it is. U.S. annual count of strong to violent tornadoes F3 and greater, 1954 through 2014. Right here you can see it. There's a very evident downward trend. If you were to draw that trend line in there using least squares or however you choose to do it, that trend would be going down from left to right. So, all tornadoes, it's held steady. More intense, stronger tornadoes actually has declined as the climate has warmed very subtly over the last 70 years. So how come they're not portraying this graph and putting it out there? How come Kamala Harris was not talking about this graph right here? Well, because it contradicts the narrative, that's why. And so I've just shown you, I've taken you through some science here. Pretty, pretty straightforward, simple science. Just, you know, statistical stuff. Now, this is why I'm saying, the graph you see there now, since it doesn't explain, it only gives aggregate numbers, doesn't give really any intensity. It doesn't explain that that website is now counting far more tornadoes of a much lesser intensity that they were, than they were counting back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And it has nothing to do with actual numbers. It just is a simple artifact of the counting and reporting methodology that's used. But now when you see these other two numbers, it tells a completely different story. And it's when you go through this step by step, take it apart, deconstruct the narrative, you begin to realize what a fraud the whole thing is. And you want to go through, want to go through any of it? Want to go through floods? Heat waves, wildfires, droughts. What do you want to talk about? Storms in general? See, this is what they're counting on is that, oh, you're going to follow the science, the debate is over. So we don't need to discuss any of this anymore. You don't need to, to even see or think about graphs like we just looked at. The debate's over. You don't need to look at any of this. So that's why I get annoyed. I can't help it. Yeah, they use the peer pressure thing. Everybody already agrees that it's yeah happening. Until you actually do, you know, oh, this is their mind. Follow the science. Follow the science. Follow the science. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Let's follow the science and see no, where it the takes the debate's us. over. How can you follow the science if the debate's over? Well, yeah. What's the point? Yeah. <laughs> well, see, here's the whole thing. This is now, and you know, okay, so the whole, they were going on and on and on. You know, this, this, these remarks about the commos making was in reference to the flooding and the storms that happened up in Kentucky, which were bad. Absolutely, they were bad. It was bad flooding. But it's nothing unprecedented. The fact is, is that the real history of climate includes these outliers, many of them, that are outside what we would consider the norm. And, you know, when you really begin, and see there again, it's like Mike always says, you got to look at the big picture. Because if we're only looking at this narrow little strip and, and, and our vision is being contracted or constricted to this narrow little window, and that's all we see, instead of the big picture where you can see, oh, wait a second, you know, hey, you, you could take any one of these graphs and depending on where you sliced it, you could make it look like something that would be completely misleading, an upward trend, a downward trend. But then when you look at the long term, there's no trend, you know. So it all depends on your, your, your frame of reference, your viewing window. So, you know, over the next couple of episodes, I want to kind of address some of the things. We'll look at, 
you, you talked about how, well, what about tornadoes, storms, hurricanes, and stuff in the past? Well, I've got a nice compilation of some pretty extraordinary things that have happened. Yeah, we got we have reports, right? But it isn't the same as global counts like we've got now. No, we have reports, but yeah, you can reports, but you can't you can't graph counts or whatever, right? Right, it's not the same. But thing, you can but... infer, sure, a lot. Yeah. Uh, and there are quite a few records from some places, but of course they're not generally globally and ex- it's not global in extent. Yeah. Yeah, but there's enough that you can see that. Yeah, because here's the thing: anything that happens now that's severe, flood in Kentucky, oh, it's climate change, which climate change was supposed to be originally global warming. They deliberately made the choice to change that in uh, I think it was 1996, or no, 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 it was 2004. They made the change. They agreed we're not going to call it global warming anymore. We're going to call it climate change. And you know why? Because by that point, the divergence problem was really cl- showing up in the computer models. There was no real trend that was of increasing temperature that was following the computer c- computerized models of the upward trend line that was, uh, that was predicted in the global warming models. So global warming is a very specific thing. When you say global warming, you're talking about the idea of an enhanced greenhouse effect. You're talking about the thermal capturability of carbon dioxide molecules up in the atmosphere and the re-radiation of the long wave radiation emanating from the Earth back to the Earth, while at the same time other long wave radiation is escaping the space. And it's a very precise, specific process that that you can analyze. And the problem is is that when you do that, you discover that there's only a limited range of atmospheric concentrations at which carbon dioxide is effectively entrapping and re-radiating long-wave radiation. And that window, which runs roughly between 14 and 17 microns, is filled. I mean, it's filled. There's the, it, it, the, the, the amount of heat that will, will pass through that window is relatively minuscule. And we're going to talk about that because we're going to look at the graphs of the uh, inverse exponential curve, which is the, 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 the thermal capturability of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. It is actually well known among atmospheric scientists that the majority of heat is trapped by the first 50 parts per million. Trapping heat, and of course, 50 parts per million is not enough to sustain photosynthesis. At 50 parts per million, pretty much almost all plant life on Earth would die. In fact, it starts dying once it gets below 180 parts per million, and that's what it was during the late glacial maximum. In other words, during that late glacial maximum, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations got so low that if they got any lower, plant life would start shutting down and dying off. In fact, for most of history, and we're going to look at the big picture, for most of history, uh, Earth's carbon dioxide concentrations have been a thousand parts per million or more, up to some of I think seven to eight thousand parts per million. So again, it's all a matter of perspective. But um, well, yeah. and they plaster it all over the TV and all the news channels and the Weather Channel have all these people out in the middle of the storm, and it's mm-hmm. this recency bias, you know. Oh well, it, it made more of an imprint on your memory because they had all this coverage of it. And yeah. they had all these cameras everywhere, and it makes it look worse than. So you just, yeah, yeah, it's got to be worse, right? I saw, I saw it. I yeah, saw how big bad it problem. Was. The big problem we got to worry about is the increasing number of galaxies out there. <laughs> yeah, they put up the James Webb Telescope. Yeah, a whole bunch they're, more galaxies they're appear everywhere. They're just breeding like, like wild, like flies. Uh. Okay. All uh, right, Randall. What, do, what's your plan for next show? That's, what do you that's think? some powerful graphs. Thank well, you. Well, we'll we'll keep on. We're gonna have we're gonna devote a few episodes, and you know, I know this may not be the 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 main thing that a lot of people are tuning in for, but I hope they stick with it because we're gonna do kind of do a systematic deconstruction of a lot of these the claims that are now being made now that COVID has waned into the past. They're ramping up the climate crisis propaganda again big time and so in our small way we're going to put out an alternative narrative to the well, climate I think a crisis lot of people are tuning in to yeah don't give me the status quo news 
Good. You know, I hope so. Show show me that science. You know, Randall's dug deep. You know, I, I'm going to trust Randall because he he's going to show me what's there, not what is uh, preferred to be shown by the wh- whoever's right, whoever's paying the speechwriters. Well, I may I'm not a look, first of all disclaimer. I'm not a hundred percent trustworthy. <laughs> However, it's it, it's not intentional. Okay, I occasionally get things wrong, but usually it's a detail here, a detail there, and it doesn't affect the big picture, right? Like I actually did, I I made a mistake uh, once upon yeah, a time. In, in I think it was seventy six. I think yeah. yeah, it was. I was about to say it was nineteen seventy six. Yeah, we need to mark that year. Yeah, <laughs> the year. The ran made a mistake. It was, it was the yeah. year you met Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. That 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 was the era. That was the epoch before Mike. That was that was pre Mike. No, not even pre Atlanta, or that was right when you got to Atlanta. All right, well, I'm you just kidding with you, Mike. Since you met Mike, you haven't made a mistake. That's you know, <laughs> that's pretty that's good. how you can think of it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's pretty much it. Yeah, well, I look. I'm going to go ahead and admit, 1997, I did make a little boo boo. Uh oh. Okay, I'll put that in the calendar too. <laughs> I knew about 1976. I did not know about 97. No, uh, here's what I've noticed. The trend line for me is that. Hopefully, I made more mistakes in the past when I was dumber. But as I've gotten a little more well-educated, I make less mistakes. Um, hey, okay, I've done my share of dumb things, I'll admit. I'm sure there's some stories there that, oh, yeah, there are. I don't want to tell them at the moment, though, because they're too embarrassing. <laughs> hey, wait a second. You met me in 97. Oh, 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 mistake number two. Mistake <laughs> number two in 97. Oh, man. <laughs> well, you notice I started to go there, Brad, but then I, oh, I, I held my tongue. Let's you not know, tell I, that story. <laughs> I better not tell that, was, that story. That was right after the 2 by 12 to the nose. It was. When I showed up. The 2, the two by 12 to the nose. You showed up right after That's the 2 true. by 12 to the Oh, my God. Yeah, I was commenting today uh no yesterday i went to the dentist a few days ago and i came out 100 percent clean and i thought this is awesomely good because i hadn't even been to the dentist in a couple of years but i had a period there where over a period of five or six years i had enormous amounts of trouble with my upper teeth and one by one they started going bad and I thought, what the hell's going on? Because my bottom teeth are fine. They've continued to be fine, right? So I had to get all this major reconstructive work done on my upper. Well, then I got to thinking, and, and I asked the, 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 the orthodontist about this, and he said, yeah, it's very possible. But yeah, when I got clobbered with that 2 by 12 across the face so hard, it may have, you know, damaged the teeth in the Absolutely. socket. Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. Wow. Yeah, Oof. sure. Huh. That was uh, not a fun experience, but there was sort of a interesting sidelight to that. But we'll save that story. And I see Brad <laughs> a little bit grinning because he bit knows he knows the story. <laughs> um, but uh, that'll be a story for you know. It, it, as as I know that my days on Earth are coming to a close, and I write my memoirs and my confessions, I'll put that story in there. Or maybe a campfire on a tour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, or maybe or maybe a campfire on a tour. Quincy, if, if you, had, you invented a flex capacitor or something cool like that after you got hit, right? <laughs> no. Well, oh. well, all I will say is that it happened on an Easter Sunday, and involved pagans, but. <laughs> but. <laughs> Well, not, oh, Lord. It involved right. a, group, a, teaser, a group folks. of pagans, so <laughs> <laughs> leave it at that. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we'll, we better leave it at that. Yeah, we'll be continuing with this Beautiful. with this topic for at least the next couple of episodes. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Check out RandallCarlson.com for all your Randall Carlson stuff, and contact at thecabin.com if you want to come on any of the tours. And, of course, don't forget to, if you're interested in the Sacred Geomet- Geometry course, by the time this comes out, it's still available. Oh, yeah, it's uh, going to stay available. It's going to be available as a, as a download, and you can still take the course. It just won't be live. So thank you, guys. Great show tonight. 
See you Good next night. time. Good awesome. night, my friends. Good night, gentlemen. Great, Randall.